Excellent. This last um, sprint, we had three new exploits. Uh, they're all pretty interesting. Um, they all have pretty high CVSS scores as well. Um, PHP MyAdmin, I think, actually landed a couple days ago, right, Jacob? And uh, that is a, a remote code execution. I believe it doesn't even require authentication to uh, get in, right? That one does, um, it does. but it, it sets the uh, username and password to the default for PHP MyAdmin. Okay. Cool. Well, then, that, yeah, there's not really that much of an authentication at that point. Uh, some some pretty interesting stuff there. Another um, Linux libc uh, es escalation as well. Um, it's kind of interesting that we had both CVSS well, one million and one and one 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 one. I I thought that was kind of funny. This is the uh, the week of, of binary exploits. Um, so uh, a couple of interesting things there. The DHCP uh, network manager one was a, was a bug in in Red Hat's default config, where basically you could get remote code execution just by sending a malicious DHCP packet, which was pretty hilarious in my opinion. Um, we also had a, a contributor submit a number of really awesome modules. Uh, these are kind of more focused for red teams. Uh, what they allow you to do is create all kinds of cool malicious files. You can create bad OTT, ODT files, which is a, a, a Windows um, uh, file type. I forgot what they do, though. Oh, like, what's the, the actual? It's the open office document, document, document format. format. Yeah. OK. Um, we also have bad PDF um, and, and multi-drop, which allows you to, uh, to, to target different kinds of uh, uh, file formats in one module. Um, another really cool module, I, I like this one a lot, it allows you to um, automatically enumerate what commands are executable with escalated privileges. And what this allows you to do is it'll automatically check your file system looking for uh, like set UID binaries, it'll check your pseudo configuration to see uh, what commands are runnable. Um, it even uh, uh, basically does some, some introspection to figure out um, you know, what, what is escalatable. So it's very useful from a pen testing point of view to to evaluate a system and see what you can do without having to manually try things. Um, some neat features that we added to Metasploit this, this past uh, uh, sprint are, uh, we added sound playback in Meterpreter. This was one of the Google Summer Code projects uh, for just adding kind of miscellaneous fun to Interpreter. Uh, we added IPv6 reverse TCP shell um, payloads to uh, our, our, our collection of shell codes, um, which is much more useful these days. I think IPv6 has, what, an over 50% penetration rate yep. within, within the US right now? And we had one for x64, but this is the first one for x86. That's oh, stageless. interesting. Okay. It was just in the matrix of all the different payload, architecture, IP combinations. We didn't have stageless IPv6 shells. Right. And now we do. Oh, awesome. Um, and then also, we also have uh, background command support and command shells. Um, this is also a Google code support project uh, where uh, if you've ever used a command shell payload within Metasploit, in fact, that previous payload there is a command shell payload. If you've ever used it, you may have noticed that it's hard to do things like job control. It's hard to do things like background support. Um, it's really easy to accidentally lose your, lose your shell by tipping the wrong keystrokes. Um, so this enhancement actually does some pretty cool stuff, and we'll probably show a demo of that mm -hmm. a little bit later. Sure um, we also fix a few bugs. Uh, for instance, the, there's this long time module called PSNuffle, which allows you to, to runtime packet visualization of, of packet captures as they run through. It'll like automatically detect different services. And so there were some bug fixes. There might have been some new bugs introduced as well, but we'll get to those a little bit later. Uh, also kind of a subtle sort of, um, and you, you'll probably never notice this, but there were some bugs in tag completion in the set command. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, it just works like you'd expect. It's kind of one of those sort of UX things that if you don't notice it, it's actually a, probably a good thing, but that's actually fixed now in Metasploit. So um, there's a whole lot of stuff in the way, and we've got a lot of goodness. Um, some of the demos that we're about to show will be things that will also be hopefully landed soon as well. So let's go on to it. Um, sure. So I've got the demo list kind of queued up. Uh, the first person to be demonstrating will be Aaron Soto, and he's going to be demonstrating some, some work that he's also been working on with, for Google Summer Code with one of our students. Definitely. Uh, can I talk a screen share? Of course you can. So, um, as, as we've said uh, a number of times, we've been working with uh, a number of students in our uh, Google Summer of Code program, and these are students that have a number of projects in mind. Um, and so, different members on, on the team are working in different areas, uh, but I've been working with Wang, who is, uh, doo -doo, there we go, one of our students who is working on making our uh, command uh, command shell payloads be a little more user friendly. So for those of you who've used our command shell, you know that uh, you know basically you get a callback from a box you dropped into a command prompt, but then that's like all you really have. You don't have job control. You don't have the ability to kind of uh, uh, to background things easily or switch between sessions easily. 
Um, and so this is what, uh, uh, what this project aims to solve. And there's also some stretch goals for it, uh, which I'll, I'll just leave as a teaser for now. Uh, but what we've, what we've uh, and I say we, what Wang has landed so far, uh, is the ability to kind of use command shells in a way that we're more familiar with uh, interpreters. So as a quick little demo here, you notice I have two sessions open. One is just a command, cell, uh, command shell session and the other is a interpreter session. And for those of you who've used interpreter sessions before, uh, you know you can do things like uh, background to get back to your uh, MSF console. And interpreter knows that, okay, that isn't a command I'm actually gonna send to the target, that's just I need to background this so I can do other things. But previously when you were in a command shell session, you couldn't do things like that. So when I typed background, it actually sent a command called background to the target. Well, now if I type background, notice what actually happens is uh, the, the page, you know, on the local machine, we take a moment, we pause and we say, hey, did you mean to background the session? And I can say yes. And we won't literally send background. Uh, we, can, we can switch out uh, back to our uh, uh, MSF prompt. Uh, but the other thing we have the ability to do is switch directly between sessions. So if I do sessions, for instance, two, I can jump to my interpreter session. And we used to be able to do this with interpreter, uh, but now we can also do it with command shell. So we can jump between sessions uh, much more quickly and easily. Uh, so it's, it's little things like this, and this is, this is kind of laying some groundwork so that we can start adding some meta commands into our command payload. Uh, and so we'll have some, some possible future functionality there. I know in line for the project is the ability to run resource scripts. So you can kind of automate uh, a lot of our command shell payloads in the same way that we do with interpreter payloads. Uh, but that's something in the works, so something to kind of keep an eye out for. Uh, so uh, a little bit of groundwork laying for now, uh, nothing too fancy yet, but this gives us the opportunity to do quite a bit more. That's that great. Next step for Wang? To yes. The scripts, mm -hmm. the yeah. And uh, he's done an amazing job of laying out a timeline, so he's been on schedule so far. Um, and now the next phase is to start moving into things like resource scripts. Very nice. yeah. So what if on the target box there was a sessions command that I actually wanted to run? Is there a way to escape it? Like I've just with a backslash? Or? Right now, no. And I'd be genuinely curious to know if that's something that we need to do. I mean, uh, so if you do sessions and you do anything else that it's not expecting, if you do background, you provide any, any other uh, additional output, it's going to go ahead and, and fall back to whatever that was. But if you literally needed to run a command called background, personally, I would do dot slash background or you know, provide a path to background to the same thing. But I'd be genuinely curious if anybody in the community has a use case like that that we haven't considered, then let's talk about it. Let's, let's open up an issue and let's, let's kind of hear about that. But right now, I don't think that's going to be an issue. But it's, it's a genuinely good question. Yeah, yeah. It's certainly better than hitting, con hitting control Z and your entire Met Metasploit session dies. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's leave those days behind, yeah. So anyway, there we are. Great, thank you very much. Absolutely, who's up next? So the, the next person to run the demo will be, and I hope my screen is actually sharing. Yeah. Uh, it is not right now. It isn't? Oh, that's fine. Okay. I think I see the problem. There's a, there's a modal that pops up that if I'm full screen, it doesn't show up. Um, so uh, next is Matthew Kinau, um, also showing a Google Summer Code project in, in the works. Would you like to go ahead, Matthew? Sure. I'm um, set up, we'll share the screen. So Elliot is, um, one of my my uh, Google Summer of Code students, um, and he's been he has like a really interesting plan of a bunch of little enhancements. The first of which sort of started out being this sound playback support for Meterpreter, um, and that's what I'm going to demonstrate here. Can you guys see my screen? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So on the left hand side, I'm just set up to start a multi handler. Uh, to receive the session that I'm going to start on the right side. I'm just going to run a interpreter reverse TCP. And now that we got the session, take a quick look at help. You'll note something that we haven't seen before, which is the standard API audio output command. So he's added a play command that allows you to play an audio file on the target system. So if you just play, see that you know it's going to expect you to give it a path file, a path to the audio file. Right now, I believe it's wave only. And not sure if that audio came across or not. Not for us. <laughs> no. Oh, it didn't. Oh, okay. I'm not sure why <laughs> that would happen, but it didn't. Uh, it did, in fact, play. It was a, a clip of Game Over from the Aliens movie. Uh, we'll fix it in post. Okay. 
Also, <laughs> it did. It did play here. I'm not sure if there's something I need to do with Zoom or whatnot to get it. Yeah. Your 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 mic is probably can't is probably uh, noise canceling your side. Okay. Well, the, that was a little less delivery than we wanted, but it's interesting. <laughs> it's more fun with the the audio playing. Um, but you know, this is sort of the start of a, a really interesting uh, plan that Elliot has in place. So. Definitely keep an eye on the work that he's doing and the future enhancements that he'll be delivering. Can I have to say one thing that I thought was really cool about this, and it, it, it's alluded to in the help there, is that this is sent across the network and stored directly in memory. Like I was expecting a WAV file to be written on disk, and as I was looking through the code for this, I was like, no, that's really cool, like the way that uh, the, the file just buffered in memory. Yeah, it's streamed it in the stream API. So yeah. Neat. So we're going to have, have Pandora and Spotify integration soon, I imagine. <laughs> it actually led to like interesting discussions about like virtual file systems and stuff that actually led to Elliot sort of taking a look at some of those things. So a lot of this relatively simple enhancement led to some really interesting discussions for future future work. Very cool. Right. Nice. Thank you very much. I'm going to switch it straight to Jacob, uh, who's next with uh, PA's exec um, enhancements. Jacob. 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 Okay, it's working. Um, so the enhancement to PSExec is to allow it to uh, work over SMB2. Previously, if you tried to run SMB or PSExec over SMB2, uh, yeah, I believe you would get a login failed message. Um, so even if you had the correct username, correct password to a system, it would just make it seem like it failed. Um, but now we have kind of support, well, it's in a PR. There's still some bugs that need to be fixed, and we'll probably see those here, hopefully not. Uh, but I have a Windows system running over here. I turned off SMB1. Only SMB2 is enabled, and also have Wireshark running just to prove that it's actually SMB2. Um, so hopefully we will get a session if it works. And let's see what happens. Creating service, that's good, at least. Good sign. <laughs> Good sign. But there might be a bunch yeah, of errors yeah. now. A bunch of errors, but yeah. don't pay attention to any of that. <laughs> That's uh, important. This, this is the important part. Um, session opens. And just to verify, yes, it is there. And can we interact with it? Sysinfo. Yes, we can. OK, great. So it works. Uh, as you can see, still some bugs to work through. Um, this is just, I'm throwing the errors for testing. but. You'll probably just see this line, actually, if you tried it now. Um, but yeah, so that's PS exec over SMB2. Going over to Wireshark, we could see SMB2. Um, so Jacob, this is one of those mm -hmm. that testing guys would actually use other tools for because it's not working actually, right? It's yeah, a big, big exactly. thing for us. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really good. All right, I'm going to cut it straight just because we're running low on time to William. He's going to be demonstrating some enhancements to the Eternal Exploit, uh, Eternal Blue Exploit he's been working on. Yes. Am I still doing that? Yeah, you'll be last. Okay. Okay. So, running. so um, <clears throat> some time ago, Adam added. Uh, support for external modules in Metasploit it basically means you can run modules that are non-Ruby, any kind of language, so long as you have the right way to shim it in the framework. Um, but this gives us the opportunity to extend framework with things that would normally be a bit of a hassle um, or chore to, to add natively. So um, one of the things we have is Eternal Blue. Uh, it's an exploit, um, MS17010 is patch, and um, was pretty big last year. And uh, one of the things we were lacking, um, Windows 10, Windows 8, Windows uh, Server 2012, uh, other Windows support, and um, the community has added that into their own models, or their own proof of concepts, rather, and um, so we wanted to incorporate that in. This is supposed to run in parallel with any kind of um, uh, research and understanding of Eternal Blue. Eventually, we'd like to add these targets uh, to the native module, um, but until then, this is a really good stopgap fix. Uh, so, yeah, you can take a look here. We added a new template. 
called generic, which allows you to basically shim in any kind of um, exploit, remote exploit. And here's the meat of it. We've added the proof of concept, which supports Windows 8 and up. Um, and you can see we have some metadata here, which basically matches the Metasploit modules. References, et cetera, et cetera, options. Uh, this binary blob will have to be documented, but that's kernel mode shell code. Secret sauce. <laughs> <laughs> Secret sauce. Uh, and there are reversing notes in here that the, um, the author Sleepia added. Anyway, so you can see over here, should be able to use. Can you make that bigger? Yeah. Thank you. Good. Uh, yeah, a little more. <laughs> For the video. Yeah. Thanks. Actually, whoop, whoop. My bad. Whoa. You can see uh, we have a couple of them here. Here's the original, and here's the one we've added for Windows 8 and up. Um, we might want to rename those eventually. You can use play Windows. Good. Info. Um, it's a little bit jumbled, but you can see interaction with it is much like a normal module. All we need to do is set our house on the clear. Uh, we'll tap the Oh, that was a mistake. Okay, clear. Hopefully this works. Or it crashes it. Bell parameters are good things. In this case. Uh oh. Mm. That might be bad. Let us try again. You can usually increase room allocations, but. Uh, Town Blue is a fickle beast. Yeah. Eternal, not blue. No. We'll get that one in post production, too. <laughs> Eventual Blue. Eventual Blue. <laughs> I did, I did, I did see work straight. yesterday, so I'll testify. Hmm. Amen? I, You'll testify? Yeah, amen. Does the word blue come from the blue screen? Uh, uh, we just crashed. Uh, yeah, we just there yeah. Mm. All right, I tell you what, let's, 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 uh, let's throw the camera over to Wade real quick, and you can show us the, the, um, the, uh, the C-Optification demo, and then we'll, we'll maybe come back and have a, a bonus uh, uh, Eternal Blue once we've uh, rebooted. Request, sure. how do I share my screen? Again? Unless this one run is going to work. Oh! oh. 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 Blue. Nice! <laughs> yeah. It likes rebooted systems. All right, there you go. Yeah, oh, great job. <laughs> well done, sir. <laughs> okay. Bravo. All right, tossing the mic, man. Thank you very much, Will. Yep. Uh, how do I share my screen again? Uh, uh, Will has to uh, stop sharing. Do I? No. Uh, uh, to the top. Okay. Yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, share screen. So I have a couple slides here. Basically, I just want to explain what this thing is all about. Uh, first off, I've been working on this uh, this PLC basically uh, to be able to randomize C source code, um, and for the purpose of obfuscation, and it's really for AV evasion. Uh, so first off, why do, do I want to do this? It's because while I was trying to understand how antivirus works, I noticed that obviously there's signature base. So if you're able to randomize your code, you can signature it. Uh, but that's for the, uh, for the entire file. There's also, they also calculate checksums for like uh, segments of the file. So like they might look for like specific, uh, like the import table, they might check some that using CRC and then if you just randomize that all the time like you don't have a you don't have a static uh, checksum um, it's also it's also making uh, uh, reverse engineering more difficult so these are the, some of the good reasons why you want to randomize your code often 
Um, and the thing I use is basically Metasm. Metasm has a parser that allows you to parse uh, your C code and then be able to uh, traverse through them and then modify, et cetera. Um, and um, so if, obviously if you use Pro, you notice that we have this thing called dynamic payload, which is really based on the same idea of randomization. Uh, this was uh, developed by David Maloney. And then in this, uh, in this feature, there are seven uh, templates. Basically they're like stops and then uh, this called, this uh, this tool basically uh, injects uh, these tiny uh, stops into your original source code, but it's not really uh, random enough because all you all you're doing is doing a placeholder. You so you place you have a you have a placeholder that it just replaces that block of code with something random. So it's kind of predictable because you kind of see a pattern. Uh, there's also some encoding used in in Pro's. Uh, 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 randomizer uh, using XOR. Uh, there's a, it's also using like low library and get process address to be able to call a function and some and anti debugging features. Um, here's a problem. Um, some of those uh, stops uh, are actually red flagged. For example, uh, AVs are very sensitive with loops. Uh, when you have a lot of loops, chances are AV would, uh, it's likely some kind of encoder or something at least you know when you when you if you if you watch a talk like people say this all the time if you see a lot of loops this thing is up to no good um, um, if uh, and then there's if there if there's a lot of XOR going on this thing is up to no good um, obviously you have is the is debuggy present debugger present and all these things you know your code looks makes your it makes your code look more uh, malicious looking and these are the things that kind of backfire sometimes uh, with Pro. Um, so the uh, randomizer that we're working on, you know, first off, does not it doesn't use the placeholders. So what it does is it'll just walk through this, the the functions, and then each function it'll iterate through each statement, and then it just it'll just check, uh, you know, randomly whether it wants to do it. And whether it wants to inject code or not, it just randomly happens. So it makes the code more random. There's no placeholder. Holder. Um, um, the uh, the stops templates will be easier to develop. You just write your C code. You don't have to you know you don't have to do a lot of Ruby code to be able to uh, create these templates. And uh, and um, it's going to match my framework, so people can actually play with it. And hopefully, uh, the way uh, we might want to implement is put this in the Mass Boys compiler, which uh, it's, uh, it's something that we added not too long ago. And hopefully this will be like a big package. And, and then and by that time, we'll have really good, uh, I guess, mitigations, I don't know what you call it, to really uh, fight against antivirus, at least for status scanning. And there's our final piece, which is runtime, but we'll come back like, eventually. Um, so here's a little demo. So here, so this is kind of code I've been working on, and this is the code that you'll be writing uh, to develop your malware. Um, if you want, you can pass a fake function collection. This is for creating a bunch of fake functions for your uh, for your program, but that's optional. Uh, you can also specify how often this thing here. You can also specify how random you want this code to be. One is minimal and 100 means a lot. Uh, so I'm going to do seven. OK, fine, seven. Seven is the right number, always. Seven. Probably. Seven practice. Seven, seven is a good number. Yeah. OK, if you do seven, um, you don't see a lot of random, randomization. OK, so seven, let's bump it higher, say, I don't know, 90. Uh, from zero to 100, basically. And you can see it's, it's starting to be more random. And then every time it's different. And now you compile that and then, you know, and you have something unique every time you generate your payload. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So we'll be doing this on the fly. So every time you invoke it, you'll get a new C code yep. uh, combined with the Metasploit compiler. Yep. Then you get new shell code every time you run. So there's nothing static to be signatured at all. Uh, yes. At least very little. In theory, yeah, very yeah, little. That's yeah. a theory. It'll be interesting to test it out.
is, is this is this plugged in into into framework itself? Like people can actually do generate this code when they're trying to create or attach data to Yeah, that's that's the idea. Not there yet. So but not there yet, not there yet, but that's, that's the idea, yes. Cool. Yeah. Very right, great. That's awesome. Well, uh, that's all we have time for today. Thanks everyone for, for being, or is there any questions on the line or any questions in the room about any of the demos or any of the features that we've been working on? How did you fit in so much awesome in one demo? I don't know. It was just, it just all came together at the last <laughs> minute. So. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, we'll have this, this archived and on YouTube and everything else. So uh, see you on the internet. Bye-bye. Excellent.